Hello and welcome to the latest version of the Genomics England Research Seminar. I'm Jamie Ellingford, I'm the lead genome data scientist in the rare disease team at Genomics England and a research fellow at the University of Manchester. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce two fantastic talks and we've got three really inspiring speakers for you today. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first talk, which is by Dr. Saskia Sanderson and Dr. Celine Lewis. So Saskia is a behavioural scientist and a chartered health psychologist. She holds a PhD in psychological aspects of genetic testing for complex disease susceptibility, and she completed that at UCL. During her academic career, which has spanned over 20 years, she's held positions in universities and hospitals in the UK and the US, including UCL, Great Ormond Street and Mount Sinai Health Healthcare Centre in New York. She's focused on harnessing genomics for the earlier detection and intervention to diagnose, treat and prevent diseases and conditions that impact both physical and mental health. Saskia has pri prioritised conducting and facilitating research that supports translating advances in genomic and other technologies into pr improved human healthcare. And a couple of years ago, Saskia moved to set up Our Future Health, which is the UK's largest ever health research program. I'm sure like you, you've heard and followed Saskia's work over the years. I'm really excited to hear from her today. She'll also be joined by Dr. Celine Lewis, who's a behavioral scientist working in the field of genetic and genomic medicine. Her work focuses on how patients and families relate to, communicate and make decisions around personal genetic information and the subsequent behavioral, psychological and social outcomes. I'm really excited to hear from Celine today because we, we both um, undertook the same fellowship program through Health Education England. And during that time, uh, Celine was also a co-applicant on an NIHR grant to explore the preferences, experiences and outcomes of rare disease patients through the 100,000 Genomes Project. We'll hear a little bit more about that study today. And in 2020, she received a four year NIHR advanced fellowship to evaluate the implementation of NHS genomic medicine services during its early conceptions. Importantly, that research hopes to identify barriers and enablers to successful implementation of genomic medicine services. So I'm really excited to hear this talk. Please do submit your questions through the Q&A function as we go through. And I'll hand over to Saskia and Celine now. Because these are key components of informed choice and consent. We did a number of different studies as part of this research using a multi um, mixed methods approach. And the thing I'm going to focus on particularly this afternoon is the survey that we conducted. And um, so I'll be focusing on the study on the top left hand uh, corner here in particular, um, but we, uh, as I said, we've published a number of different studies from this research, which you can find online. So first of all, the uh, first study that we did was the main study that we did um, initially was looking at um, informed choice and relevant re related factors um, at the time of consent in a survey at T1 time one. So obviously we collected data on sociodemographics. We also looked at things like perceived severity of the rare condition in the family. Um, and just to say, we were focusing on the patients and families in the rare disease arm of the 100,000 Genomes Project, not the cancer arm. We also looked at decisional conflict around genome sequencing, um, and then we looked at attitudes towards the genome sequencing. So we used um, newly developed measures, including um, uh, perceived benefits and concerns. And I think it might just have dropped off the bottom of the screen here, um, but we looked at several, um, we developed some new measures of um, knowledge about genome sequencing. So we developed the COGS, Knowledge of Genome Sequencing Measure, which is designed to be used in lots of different um, contexts. And we also developed 28 items or questions, which are specifically designed designed um, for the context of the 100,000 Genomes Project. And we went through a really rigorous design process, um, uh, iteratively developing and testing those before using them. Oh, sorry. Right. 
This just gives you um, a little overview of what we did in the survey. So we were working in six hospitals across London um, where patients and their relatives were invited, be, being invited to participate in the rare disease arm of the 100,000 Genomes Project. We invited uh, nearly 1,000 people to take part in the survey study and just over half of them, 51%, 504 people, um, completed the baseline um, questionnaire. And that's the one I'm going to focus on now. We had a range of uh, people from a range of backgrounds um, and just to draw your attention to the bottom here, just under half of them were parents of patients, mostly children with rare diseases, and just under half were patients, adult patients with rare diseases themselves, and then a few were other relatives um, of patients. In this study, almost everybody that took part self-reported that they had decided to participate in the 100,000 Genomes Project, um, and 88% self-reported that they had decided to receive the secondary or additional looked-for findings. And then actually 3% couldn't remember the decision that they'd made about the additional looked-for findings. When we asked them subjectively whether they felt that they'd made an informed decision, you can see here in the blue bar that around 90%, so really the vast majority of people did feel that they had had enough information um, and discussion with health, uh, healthcare professionals to make an informed choice about having their genome sequenced through the project. And when we looked at the same question relating to secondary or additional looked for findings, um, we actually saw pretty much identical um, responses that, again, most people felt that they had made an informed choice about the additional looked for findings. As you'd expect when it came to motivations, people were, of course, motivated to take part in the project by a desire for a diagnosis. But actually, when you look at their responses, um, they were even more uh, motivated by a desire to help others by, by the genome sequencing and taking part in the research arising from it. When we looked at concerns, we had um, a single question um, uh, relating to concern about the psychological impact, particularly of the additional look for findings. And here you can see that um, the people in the survey were more concerned about um, how the, they would feel if they got a high risk result from the additional look for findings than they were about data sharing or data access. When we looked at um, people's understanding of the genome sequencing that they were having done, uh, most participants understood the gist of the terms genome and genome sequencing. Um, and, uh, and so that's what you can see here, that people understood, for example, that genome sequencing is different to the other kinds of genetic tests they or others might have had because it looks at almost all of a person's DNA rather than only a small bit of it. And unsurprisingly, fewer participants had more advanced knowledge about these terms. And that in this context, that's completely fine. We wouldn't necessarily expect people to have that level of knowledge about this. And just again, to reiterate, these are items from the um, general measure of uh, using the COGS that we've developed separately. The limitations and uncertainties around genome sequencing were a little bit less well understood. So if you just look at the bottom item here, um, uh, fewer people, just under two thirds of people, um, uh, understood that genome sequencing might not provide a person with any meaningful information about their health. When we looked at context specific understanding, so just to remind you that's but specifically about the context of having genome sequencing done in the context of the 100,000 Genomes Project, um, it was generally high for understanding what's involved in, in, the, in the project and taking part in this research and what the purpose is, what the benefits are, what the secondary findings are, things around the secondary findings, that it's voluntary and the implications for family. Um, and so all of these are really good indicators that people were generally understanding about the genome sequencing that we haven't done. And, and all of this points towards re making relatively informed choices. In the orange bar here, you're seeing that um, the understanding of the risk about um, the risk of being identified through the research was relatively low compared to other factors. And then also understanding the limitations and uncertainties was a little bit on the lower side as well. Understanding of how the data would be stored um, was relatively high. So people understood, for example, that um, their data was gonna be stored in a secure database. Um, but then there were specifics uh, around that, um, for example, uh, in particular, um, around fewer than 40% of people understood that commercial companies um, or data um, or uh, diagnostic testing companies um, would have access to their data. So to summarize, most participants um, from this survey felt they had made an informed decision. Um, they had decided to receive the additional look for findings, the secondary findings, and felt that that was an informed decision. They were motivated both by a desire to, for a diagnosis for the family and to help others. 
their concerns were overall low um, and the concern about the potential psychological impact of the high risk results from the secondary findings um, was higher than their concerns about data sharing access. Um, and then general knowledge about genomics, most people had a, a, a good at basic understanding of what a genome and what genome sequencing is, and a little bit lower understanding of, about some of the limitations and uncertainties and risks arising from it. So as I said, we did a number of other studies, and the one that I just wanted to focus on here um, was the decliner study, because of course what you've seen so far is data from people that said that they would take part, and obviously actually 20% um, of people asked to take part, who were asked um, and invited to take part in the 100,000 Genomes Project declined. So obviously those people are a little bit harder to reach. Um, and so what we did in this study was work with our colleagues at Great Ormond Street, um, uh, who were uh, recording, writing down the reasons that people were giving them when parents of children with rare diseases were phoning them up and saying, actually, I thought about it, I don't want to take part in the 100,000 Genomes Project. So we collected data from 137 parents of children with rare diseases at Great Ormond Street Hospital who had declined to take part in the programme. And this is the one side I'll show you on this. These are the themes that arose from uh, that uh, thematic analysis of the data. So people were saying things like, actually, it, there was just too much going else going on in, in their lives at the moment, things around the blood test, things around the length of time for results, um, lack of perceived benefit to the patient, that this was unlikely to affect their medical care, they don't need a diagnosis, they might not get a result. Some parents felt that their children had had enough investigations and they didn't want to put their children, their child through further testing, and so they were reluctant for that reason. And you can see at the bottom here that there were some concerns expressed about personal data, about data access, commercial companies, data security, and so on, um, but they were somewhat quite a lot lower than these other um, more practical and um, emotional and personal reasons relating to themselves and their families, aside from the data. So lastly, um, to just summarize implications for genome sequencing policy, um, recognizing that this is a different context, again, to what's being done now clinically, but nonetheless, the consent procedures that's done in the 100,000 Genomes Project really do appear to have worked well for the main diagnostic purpose of genome sequencing in this context, um, uh, certainly among the people that we were able to talk to and interview and conduct surveys with. Using data for research purposes does seem acceptable to uh, this group of participants and patients and families, which is possibly reassuring, um, given the now underway new NHS Genomic Medicine Service. And <clears throat> participants' concerns about the secondary or additional looked for findings do highlight the need for continued research on patient reported outcomes once those results are returned. And with that, I think I'm going to, oh, and just before I hand over to Celine, um, uh, we, our research does show the value, of, I hope we've shown the value today, of the quantitative methods that are scalable, um, uh, as well as a little bit touching on the qualitative in-depth methods that we use um, and the importance of continuing this research in the new um, genomic medicine service. And now I will hand over to Celine. Thanks, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna present some of the findings from the time two survey that we conducted. And this was sent out around 12 to 18 months after we'd sent out the, or we'd received the time one, <coughs> excuse me, survey back from participants. So um, the aim of this time two survey was really to look at both knowledge and attitudes again, but also some of the outcomes um, from receiving a result from 100K. Um, so in this time two survey, we actually specifically looked at the COGS um, knowledge. So we wanted to know whether people um, had retained knowledge about what whole genome sequencing was. We wanted to look at uh, participants' attitudes to see if these had changed. And so we used the two attitude measures that Saskia mentioned earlier, the general attitude scale and the context specific one. Uh, we looked at decisional regrets, so whether participants regretted having had genome sequencing done. And we also looked at the psychological impact. And what you can see here is, um, as Saskia said, we had around 51% of participants that we sent a survey to at time one, completed it and sent it back. So that was 504. And of those 504, 296 participants uh, completed and returned the time to questionnaire. So um, of those that returned a questionnaire, we found that 77 participants had received a result. And of those, 24 had received a diagnostic result. 47 had received a no findings result and six weren't sure. And 198 of the 296 had not received a result yet. And that was uh, so around sort of 12 to 18 months after um, the consent discussion. 
And then 21 responders said that they weren't sure whether they had received a result or not. So one of the things we were interested in looking at is looking at whether knowledge had declined over that time period. And what we see here is that when we compared scores between time one and time two, interestingly, it showed us that general knowledge of genome sequencing as measured on the nine item COG scale had actually remained pretty stable over time. And it didn't differ as a, um, across groups either over time. Um, so if we then look at general attitudes towards genome sequencing, so at time two, attitudes were generally positive. So the majority of participants strongly agreed that genome sequencing was beneficial, uh, it was important, it was a good thing, and it was helpful. And attitudes were stable across time um, and across individuals. And there was sort of no difference really between time one and time two. And that included amongst participants that hadn't received a result, as well as those that had. And then if we look at the specific attitudes towards genome sequencing, so that was the set of 14 items, seven of which were positive attitudes and seven of which were more negative attitudes or concerns. We can see that um, positive attitudes and negative attitudes remained relatively stable across individuals between time one and time two. And there was a sort of slight increase in positive attitudes and a slight decrease in negative attitudes, but it wasn't found to be significant. Um, so we have to conclude that this didn't really change over time. Um, we looked at decisional regret at time two, and what we found was that across all participants, the mean decisional regret score was 12.26, which given the maximum score was um, 100, shows that regret was low. Um, and what we also did was we classified decisional regret into three categories that had been used elsewhere in the literature, where zero um, equated to no regret, a score of five to 25 meant mild regret and a score over 30 indicated moderate to strong regret. And viewing the data in terms of these discrete um, categories sort of corroborated our findings and showed that few people had high levels of regret. Um, so attitudes towards genome sequencing and time, um, interestingly, yeah, and attitudes towards genome sequencing and time one were um, related to decisional regret at time two. Um, what we actually found was that people with a lower positive attitude at the outset of undergoing genome sequencing felt greater regret 12 to 18 months later. And we found this for both the general attitude measure as well as the specific attitude measure. So those who saw fewer benefits and who had greater concerns about genome sequencing at the outset had greater regret 12 to 18 months later. So to assess the psychological impact of the results, we used an adapted form of the multidimensional impact of cancer risk assessment, otherwise known as the MICRA. And this is a 17 item scale where a higher score indicates a greater vulnerability to genetic testing related distress. To, to, to genetic testing related distress. And it's composed of three subscales, distress, uncertainty, and positive experiences. And um, the MICRA was only included at time two and completed by those who had re reported receiving a result. And what we found was that across all participants um, who completed this assessment, the overall mean score was 17.2, which given the maximum possible score was 85, indicates low negative psychological impact. So in general, people indicated that they were not overwhelmingly distressed by their genome sequencing results. Nonetheless, when we looked at the subscales independently, we found that the mean score um, of the positive experiences subscale was only 2.8 and indicating that people didn't feel particularly positive about their results. So interestingly, we found um, that uh, around 57% of participants never or rarely felt happy about their or their child's results. And nearly 40% never felt relieved about it. Um, and this really matched um, with some of the qualitative interview findings. Um, we found when we were doing the interviews that um, in most cases, the sort of more negative emotions like disappointment and sadness were experienced by patients and parents with a no findings result. And this disappointment was often caused by a mismatch between people's expectations of receiving a diagnosis and their actual result. Um, and we also identified feelings of isolation um, from uh, particularly when uh, a, rare, a very rare disease was diagnosed and there wasn't very much information or support, support about it. Um, one of the things that we also looked at, which was interesting, was whether there were differences between parents and patients. And what you can see here, um, that particularly for the distress and uncertainty scale, um, parents experience more distress and uncertainty than patients. 
And we think that these differences could possibly be due to differences in perceived quality of life with patients who've lived with their condition for many years, having a different perspective to parents who don't know how their child's condition may unfold over time and are unsure of occurrence risk. And it could also possibly be related to the fact that adult participants um, were cognitively sort of able to um, complete the questionnaire and may therefore sort of um, be less significantly impacted by the condition than some of the child patients. Um, so um, in summary, sort of like other work in which public attitudes towards genome sequencing have been shown to be favorable, our study showed that in general, people felt very positively about genome sequencing. Um, and we also found that um, there was sort of little decisional regret 12 to 18 months later, regardless of whether results had been received or not. Um, however, interestingly, regret was highest amongst those who were the least positive and had the greatest concerns about genome sequencing, which is possibly not surprising. But I think that this finding has um, implications for clinical practice, really, that you know, pretest counselling, it's really important that it's delivered by someone who can competently discuss both the benefits and limitations of the test, and secondly, that time should be spent exploring patients' attitudes towards genome sequencing and ensuring that any negative attitudes are not a result of misunderstanding or misinformation about the technology. Um, and finally, really, the results from our survey indicate that the, the sort of negative psychological impacts of receiving a result are minimal. Um, although the caveat to this is that we did identify instances during our interviews where for some participants there were negative experiences associated with receiving a genomic result, and that included both those that received a positive uh, a diagnostic, but also a no findings result. Um, and then just briefly, I wanted to mention to you sort of what's happened since the end of that project. Um, so as you all know, since the end of the 100,000 Genomes Project, we've now rolled out uh, the Genomic Medicine Service. Um, and um, I am now um, in the middle, I guess, of doing an NIHR advanced fellowship um, with the aim of evaluating the implementation of, gene of the genomic medicine service. And so the aim is really to identify some of the barriers and enablers implementation and provide recommendations for practice. And um, I'm doing this through a number of different studies, including observing patients um, being consented for whole genome sequencing and also receiving their results as well as doing interviews with uh, genetic and non-genetic health professionals to understand more about the issues associated with mainstreaming of genomics. And we're also going to be looking at um, uh, doing a longitudinal survey with parents at two time points and seeing if we can sort of tease out where um, sort of whether the impact of genome sequencing differs um, depending on what condition type um, the patient has. And with that, um, I'd like to just acknowledge the efforts, particularly of all the sites that helped us hand out these surveys, which was quite a mammoth task, really. Um, but most importantly, thanking the uh, participants without whom this work would not be possible. Um, and that's the end of the presentation. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much both. I know one of the disappointing things about uh, presenting online is that isn't greeted with a massive round of applause, but that was absolutely fantastic and really clear talk and really, really important data. Um, for those of you online, we've still got the Q&A uh, function open and we've got a bit of time to ask questions. There's already some there, but please keep them coming in and we can ask them uh, non-synchronously as the, uh, the second talk happens as well. Um, so first question is around um, secondary findings and how we went about identifying relevant additional findings that could be reported back to individuals. I know there's some resources online and I think Gillian Hastings Boards has put um, a link to that resource in the chat, but I just wondered whether you two wanted to elaborate on that at all. And you're probably in a better position than us to, <laughs> to speak to that, but I think thank you to Gillian for putting the um, resources in the chat. Um, the the uh, additional look for findings are include the cancers and heart conditions that are on the American were, were some were actually a subset of um, cancers uh, that are known to have variants in specific genes um, that are clinically actionable. Um, uh, but Jamie, I think you could probably speak better than us to where exactly we are in that process now. So there's always a, a well-documented link uh, list of genes that um, will be reported back. And I think an important thing to make clear is that people are educated about that before they sign up and have the option to sign in or out. Yeah. Um, 
Fantastic. I've got a quick question for myself, actually, if that's um, OK. So we looked at time one and time two. Are there plans for time three or four? And if you did that again, would there be time three or four? And when would they be best placed to be as in part of that participant's journey through? We would love to do a time three and time four if we could in an ideal world. But I think in, I think one of I think one of the issues is it just took so long to get the results back, actually, that initially we wanted to hand out the time two survey sort of six to 12 months later, but it was just becoming very clear that a lot of participants hadn't received their results, which is why we ended up pushing it back further. But I think what would be really interesting and what I'm going to be trying to do in my current project is um, at least a, um, sort of returning to participants at least a year after they've received their whole genome sequencing results to see sort of the more long-term trends in, in terms of the kind of clinical, behavioural and psychological impact of receiving a result. Great. Um, question from Jade Richardson is whether there's plans to expand this to the cancer cohort as well as the rare disease cohort? Um, yeah, I mean, again, in an ideal world, uh, we would have loved to have done that, but I think just with the resources and the limitations that, that, uh, that we sort of had in terms of, yeah, money and et cetera, that we decided to focus on rare diseases. Um, I think mainly because that's where sort of Saskia and I have done quite a lot of work in the past and also being based at Great Ormond Street at that time. Um, but yes, would like to, to, to do that with cancer participants. That'd be really interesting because I think there'll be quite stark differences between the experiences of patients having WGS for rare diseases versus cancer. I think Gillian's just left, but I'll ask her a question anyway, which was, um, it was exploring some of the factors, I think, around decisional regret and whether communicating to individuals earlier on in the process that whole genome analysis really meant panel analysis of known disease genes, whether that would impact the findings in some, in some way. Yes, I mean, I... It's interesting to try and understand and unpick why there was decisional regret. And it might be that there are misunderstandings about the diagnostic yield, um, potentially that participants thought that they would get a result. Um, I don't know, Saskia, do you have any thoughts about that? No, I think, I mean, I think Julian makes a really, really good point. Obviously we speak about genome sequencing as, you know, looking at all of the DNA in a, in a person's genome rather than just a bit of it. But Julian makes the excellent point that actually, that's that's true on one level, but actually when it comes to interpreting that data, actually what's often done, as is done here, um, uh, it is looking at a subset of the DNA um, uh, for that particular patient. And so I think Gillian just makes the, the very good point that that probably is partly what's contributing to some people's sort of regret or slight disappointment um, and their mismatch between, between what they understood to be being done and, and what their expectations were and then subsequently what they learned. Um, but I'm sure she, I, I think she's absolutely right that there are things that can be done around sort of communication at the time of consent, communication more generally, um, uh, and you know, hopefully, and I'm sure things will change with the technology and the interpretation processes over time as well. I'm sure they already are. And that's where time two and uh, time three and four might be really important as we learn right. more about the genome, we can expand what we look at. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a huge amount of questions in the chat and we're not going to get through all of these. So I'm going to ask one more and hopefully you guys could go and answer these as we go on to the next talk. But um, a question from James Fasham is whether there's any geographical differences. So I know you looked at several different hospitals in London. Do you get a sense of whether that might be different if you expanded to different parts of the UK? And I guess linked to that is how much support there is for participants as they sign up for the programme. I'm happy to speak to the first part of that. I think probably beyond the scope of what I could address in the second. But I mean, yeah, we were obviously Great Ormond Street Hospital is not is not typical of, of all of the experiences that um, children and families will necessarily experience elsewhere across the country. And the same with um, some of the other London hospitals. So I think I think it's a really good question. Obviously, we only can speak to the data that we collected and the insights that we collected um, from and with the patients and families in the six London hospitals um, that we work with. Um, and I think um, it, it's a really good point to about not over extrapolating um, from, from that to um, geographical um, differences across the country. And I think, Celine, you might be 
working in your in your current fellowship to to work more broadly geographically yeah that's right Saskia so um we've got seven different sites um who are sort of helping uh disseminate the survey and where we're doing observations of appointments um to see if things are done very differently in different centers and also interestingly in different departments so whether consent discussions happen very differently within the clinical genetics department compared to say a pediatric neurology um, department so we will be trying to sort of tease out differences in terms of the geographical location but also um, the, the clinical context great you've caused a lot of discussion and hopefully you can go and answer a couple of those questions um, as we continue but thank you both very much again and hopefully we can hear more about this as um, as the research and the data evolves thank you thank you Great, so we move on to the second talk of this session, which is from Dr. Nick Owen. So it's a pleasure to introduce Nick, who's a research fellow at the Ocular Genomics and Therapeutics Group at the Institute of Ophthalmology at UCL. And Nick uses all sorts of multiomic techniques to further understand the causes of inherited ocular diseases. He's working at the interface of rare disease translational research and data analysis, and has migrated from a wet lab scientists sitting at the bench with pipettes to a dry lab scientist looking at um, data and computers. Um, and so prior to this, Nick obtained his DPhil at the University of Oxford um, on spinal muscular atrophy. And this was followed by some postdoctoral research into the development of antisense therapeutic approaches to um, spinal muscular atrophy. Nick now specializes in splicing related diseases. Um, and he's moved into the field of ophthalmic genomics, which is very close to my heart. Um, so it's really great to hear from you, Nick, and hopefully we'll hear a little bit around zebrafish and maybe some 3D um, organoid cultures. And so the title of Nick's talk is The Identification of Novel Human Ocular Coloboma Genes Through Evolutionary Conserved Vertebrate Gene Analysis. Thank you, Jamie. Appreciate the invitation to talk to you today. I hope you can hear me, actually. Okay, well, let me share my screen. Okay, so thank you for allowing me to talk to you today. I'm a postdoc in Professor Maria Musaje's group at the UCL Institute of Ophthalmology and Moorfields Eye Hospital. And I'm going to talk to you about our research to expand the understanding of eye development and disease, in particular, optic fissure closure uh, and the way that we've used the whole genome sequencing data at uh, Genomics England. So developmental eye disorders really are amongst the most common cause of severe visual impairment in children. And they compromise a wide range of congenital abnormalities ranging from anophthalmia and radio and are frequently associated with extraocular features. One of the early major onset diseases arising between weeks, say, four to seven of gestation are the microphthalmia, anophthalmia, and coloboma, the MAC spectrum. This varies in severity from complete absence of the eye, which you can see at the top panel, which is anophthalmia, and we have small underdeveloped eyes, microphthalmia, and you also get incomplete fusion of the optic fissure in eye development leading to a persistent cleft where it can be spanning different regions of the eye, the iris, ciliary body, the retina, the RPE, and the middle panel really showing an iris uh, cleft. It's got a variable effect on vision, dependent on the severity and the area of the eye affected. And ocular coloboma itself can occur as disorder on its own, isolated. It's part of a complex disorder associated with another eye disorder, for example, microphthalmia and coloboma, or as part of a syndrome involving other parts of the body. All these disorders are caused by a disruption of key regulatory genes, including numerous transcription factors that are really essential for normal eye development. And I hope is by understanding the roles of the gene in development, we can get to the pathological mechanisms and the phenotypic variation can be better understood and hopefully improve diagnosis and management of patients as well. So to briefly go over what's going on with eye development, uh, 
This happens early on from in humans at gestation day 20 to 20, 21 to 25. Uh, and the optic fissure itself is a consequence of formation of the retina. So during early eye morphogenesis, the forebrain tissue that becomes the eye evaginates to form an optic vesicle, which you can see on the left hand side. The subsequent evagination of this optic vesicle shapes the epithelial cells into a bilayered optic cup. And the consequence of this is that there's a fissure that will remain open as in 3D, this tissue uh, moves to fuse. This will remain open, and that is the optic fissure. It remains open to establish uh, the establishment of the vascular inside vasculature inside the retina. And once that's invaded, the fissure closes to ensure continuous retinal tissue structure. And failure of the fissure closure can have significant impact on retinal function, as you can imagine, and presents in humans as congenital coloboma. Excuse me. And patients can have complete loss of vision in the affected eye, depending on how far the fissure remains open, especially in regard to the optic stalk. So what is known at the moment, there's approximately over 100 genes associated with the max spectrum. And these are a huge network of key regulatory genes, including numerous eye film transcription factors that really have been researched over decades of research and they're essential for normal eye development. But although many genes have been discovered uh, that cause ocular coloboma and MAC, microphthalmia and anophthalmia, many MAC patients still don't have a genetic diagnosis. As you can see here, uh, this data is from more fields from this year. The overall percentage confirmed patients for genetic eye disease is around 55%, which is improving all the time. But as you can see with anterior segment dysgenesis and MAC, these percentages are still fairly low. So for this reason, our work focuses on discovering novel genes that would be involved in normal ocular development that when disrupted could be leading to these phenotypes. One of the ways in which we're doing this research is utilizing the zebrafish, which is a great model system. I won't go into too much detail about it, but the eyes of the zebrafish are relatively large to the overall size of the body, uh, to the fish itself, making manipulation of the eye bed really easy. And it's great for early embryonic time points. It's a translucent, transparent embryo larva, and we can get large numbers of eggs per leg. And it's really good for genetic tractability, cheap housing, and rapid assessment of embryological development. And the great thing is that the actual retina, for example, as, long, as well as the rest of the eye, is very similar structurally to the human eye and the way that it develops. And the zebrafish is visually responsive after about three days post-fertilization. So I've just put this up as an example. You can see a conservation of the layers in the retina. So what Professor Mishaji's group is working on is using multiple models, uh, in this case, for looking at genes and normal optic fissure closure. And one of the ways that we did it was as say to use the zebrafish, but we're also using 3D retinal organoids, which Jamie mentioned, as well as RPE, retinous, retinal pigmented epithelium uh, that are generated from patient stem cells. And we're combining transcriptomics, genomics, epigenomics to get the best insight that we can. Uh, I'm not going to talk about RNA-seq as such, but basically all the approaches for all the different protocols for RNA-seq had the five major steps, uh, which everybody is used as a gold standard now for expression. So we wanted to use this for expression analysis of what's going on in transcriptomes, pre-fusion, fusing, and post-fusing using zebrafish embryos. The time points for the zebrafish are around 32 hours for pre-fusion, uh, 48 hours fusing, so the two fronts of the optic fissure are touching, and there's complete fusion by 56 hours. 
And what we did was dissected approximately 100 microns of tissue from either side of the optic fissure and extracted RNA for RNA sequencing. And in this way, we we're able to assess the spatial temporal expression of genes throughout the optic fissure. And I've highlighted the regions uh, approximately that we took for analysis. As you can see from the principal component analysis at the bottom left, we have distinction of the samples at 32 hours, but the 48 and 56 were very similar. And that came through from the differential expressed genes. We managed to identify just under 200 DEGs at 32 hours, and 48 hours and 56, they were around 70. But the interesting thing from the enrichment from the representation analysis, we were getting ontologies involved with cell proliferation and cell fate. So these were fitting well with development and embryonic development itself. Uh, but interestingly, if we looked through the pathways for gene set enrichment analysis, we were getting at the top left, you'll see there's a cluster there with the Wnt and the bone morphogenic protein signaling pathways and the F ring. And these are known pathways for optic fissure fusion and eye development anyway. So we were coming out with some nice things there, some positives. Uh, we're getting optic nerve development, which over time you can imagine with the closure of the fissure, that's where the optic nerves are really coming in. But interestingly, the center of the other cluster was heart looping. Uh, heart looping itself is an event that results from fusion, uh, tissue fusion and internal communication from many parts of the heart tube. And it allows a straight heart tube to form more complex structure reminiscent of what we know as the adult heart. Uh, most cardiac looping occurs around the fourth or fifth week of development. So it was interesting to see another fusion tissue fusion event also coming up. So this demonstrates the conservation of some of the underlying pathways in tissue fusion. Excuse me. Uh, and we could look temporally, excuse me, at the expression patterns of genes. And I've highlighted the blue gene, you may not be able to read the text, but that's Netrin 1, which we went to further validate uh, of an interesting gene. Uh, we'd also found VAX and the TBX genes, which are involved in uh, TTF beta pathway. So there were some known candidates of interest, but some also some novel ones. Uh, we moved on to look at Netrin itself, and you can see the pink graph on pink bar of the graph on the left. The expression of Netrin one is very high uh, pre-fusion event. So to cut a long story short with this, so then want to get on to the uh, Genomics England data analysis, we looked in the zebrafish at knocking this out through translation of morpholinos and managed to identify that it caused a coloboma, which you see in the middle panel, the wild type versus the morphant. There's a really nice ocular coloboma coming through. And we have gone on to find uh, patients a patient with a metrin variant of interest. So why I mentioned this work initially is that we wanted to be able to assess deeper what's going on with other species as well. So we wanted to look at the conservation of gene expression at the time points of development of the eye uh, because it's a highly conserved process across species. So we wanted to combine our data on differential expressed genes from the zebrafish with similar research. And in this case, it was on the mouse optic fissure closure. And we managed to identify nine interesting genes, candidate genes. Uh, you'll notice one of those genes in the second panel is SMOC1. This has been previously identified as a causative gene for both anophthalmia and microphthalmia. And interestingly, the zebrafish morphant knockdown uh, results in a small eye phenotype, but it did lack a coloboma. Uh, the other gene I quickly mentioned, ZBTB4. Uh, the problem with this one is that it showed high embryonic mortality rate, but uh, the surviving morphants really had early development defects, so we excluded this from further analysis. But we're interested in this group of genes as potentially being candidates for ocular coloboma or microphthalmia defects. So we looked at whole in situ hybridization to validate the spatial expression of the candidates. 
I'm only showing two, three genes in this case. Uh, ANC3, which showed expression at 32, 48, and 56, primarily in the lens and diffuse expression in the retinal ganglion cell there. Anchorins themselves are a family of proteins whose key role is linking membrane spanning proteins to actin. And ANC3 in this case is specifically required for epithelium cell polarity, proliferation, and cell survival, which is quite appropriate for the roles that we're looking at in the eye. BMPR1B, the reason there's an A and B uh, is that, as many of you know, the zebrafish has gene duplication for a lot of genes. Uh, it was expressed at the edges of the optic fissure in the ventral region, and it even persisted post-fusion 56 hours, so we've got a nice expression there. BMP signaling itself is known to work, sorry, oops, it's known to work at two key stages in eye development, that and during gastrulation and the optic morphogenesis. And it's been known that other partners in the BMP pathways cause MAC phenotype or loss of BMP4, uh, BMP7 loss, you get coloboma. So these were nice and candidate genes. To characterize the loss of function of these in zebrafish, we individually knocked down the candidate genes using translational blocking morpholinos. A uh, 72 hour time point was chosen really to avoid any non specific delay to the optic fissure closure itself, which will be completed normally by the 56 hours. As you can see, there is significant reduction in the eye size generally compared to the control morpholino treated fish. Uh, the green stain is for laminin, really to show the outline of the membranes so we can see where the fissure is and also whether it's fused or not. And it clearly shows in both BMP or BA and BB and the combination of, as well as the anchorings that we were getting a coloboma and significantly a microphthalmia of the eye size cream type. PDGFAA itself didn't show a coloboma, but the B gene did, which I've shown here. So we've got a number of genes, which when we're knocking them out, we will see the optic coloboma and the microbes out there. So moving on to the whole genomes, this slide's slightly outdated now, and many of you will know this data inside out. But the point I wanted to show from all those sequencing and results been reported, generally only around 20% of patients have a solved uh, report, uh, with 70% still unsolved. Therefore, this is a massive resource for us to mine with for variants of interest in novel genes as we try to identify them from the biology. What's important is most of the variants associated with non syndromic MAC arise as de novo sporadic. So, what we did is identified provans, a group of provans of families where available using HPO terms, uh, looking specifically for microphthalmia, lymphthalmia, and coloboma through your lab key, identified 291 MAC probands and screened for or filtered rather through for variants on the nine candidate genes, including SNPs, NLs, copy number variants, and structural variants. Of the nearly 1,400 variants identified, they were filtered annotated, sorry, filtered for suitable frequency and segregation in family members if they're present in the gel. Um, we identified six families of further interest for four of the genes. So to show you, ah, yes, uh, I said six families, we identified six unfold fam unsolved families of interest, but we're also in collaboration with Professor Brown Brooks at the National Eye Institute in the US, and we found another further two families, so we have a total of eight families. The in silico predictions uh, presented here, there were some of them, uh, show that the variants are potentially disease causing. So next stage was really after identifying these, uh, could we show, oh sorry, I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> these are the families, the beauty of the position that we're in is that a significant portion of the MAC patients in gel uh, were presented through Gosh or Moorfields. Therefore, we do have access to further clinical information. 
of the ones we didn't, we did for request further details through the research embassy for patients outside of our reach. Family in one, these are both BMPR1 gene families, uh, variants. Family one is an Indian non consanguineous pedigree, but there's also a dominant inheritance. The mother and two daughters are affected, and they've got a heterozygous missense variant and predicted damaging in BMPR1B. The photographs on the right, we've got a wide field color fundus photograph of the right eye of the proband and the sibling. Uh, showing a large optic disc coloboma extending uh, through the region associated with the RPE, the retinal pigment epithelium. Unfortunately, the left eye was not available in this case. Above is the wide field color fundus photograph of the right and left eye of proband 1-4, which has a bilateral optic disc coloboma, which thankfully spared the macula, but has an irregular asymmetrical atrophy in the right eye. Family two is, uh, sorry, has a non consanguineous pedigree with one affected male with de novo sporadic heterozygous missense variant again in the same gene. And what it's shown with the anterior segment color photographs of the right and the left eye of the proband, uh, that there's a bilateral inferior iris coloboma. So you can see quite nicely that the iris is not formed properly. But if you look further in white field color fundus photographs, you'll also see there's a current retinal coloboma. So that white area where the retina is missing, which is an extensive, which covers, sorry, the extensive uh, miss on the optic disc and the macula itself. So how could we go on and prove that the variants of interest were pathogenic? We use the zebrafish again. So if, remember, I mentioned that with the morphants, we have the injected control, but the morphants themselves showed inocular coloboma and microphthalmia. We validated the effects of the variants through rescue experiments with the human mRNA in the zebrafish, so co-injection. And we managed to rescue the phenotype quite nicely. So we see that normal body, normal eye size, and no coloboma. What we then went on to do is confirm that human mRNA carrying patient specific variants couldn't rescue. So these are all the variants of BMP, LMB that were identified through the gel data set that have been replicated through site directed mutagenesis and injected into the morphant to try and rescue. And we could confirm the loss of function effects of these variants definitely with this system. When you quantify this, and we can look through the measurements, there on the left-hand panel is the A gene. Uh, we were showing quite nicely the reduction in eye diameter that was rescued with wild type, but not with the mutants. And the same for the B gene, but to a less degree. So what we've shown to conclude is that we've combined the approaches of a multidisciplinary team at assessing conserved biological function through conservation of transcriptional changes over optic fissure fusion. And by integrating the data sets of different species, we've identified conserved candidate genes which were experimentally validated in model systems. This has then been interrogated, used to interrogate the Genomics England data set for variants of these new genes of interest, identifying families with novel causative variants, and that using the model systems again were confirmed as loss of function variants. And it's all been made possible really through a combination of this multidisciplinary team working together. So I'd like to thank Professor Masaji and the members involved in this research, as well as collaborators and the funding bodies and Genomics England for the invaluable resource and support of the team involved. Importantly, I'd like to thank all the patients and families that have been involved in supporting us as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. That was, again, that was a really clear talk and some really interesting data. It shows the real value of having these model systems in place so that we can take findings from the genome all the way through to functional analysis and um, please do use the q a function there are one or two questions in there already i'm going to start with one of my own whilst people um continue to ask if that's okay 
So you, you suggested there was lots of other types of omics data, and you talked a little bit about the transcriptome. What other data sets do you have, both for zebrafish and for organoids, and are you integrating those into analysis in a similar way? Yes. Uh, okay, so this was the start of the work. We have uh, DNA methylation uh, data, we have attack seat data, we've got other RNA seat data sets that we're looking with the retinal organoids themselves. We have a great number of patients that have don't kindly donated skin fibroblasts, so we have different mutations and different genes to get the organoids going as well. And we, we've got a vast amount of data at the minute, to be honest, to go through. Uh, but this is really the start of where the cons conserved data was coming through and its utility. Uh, we're expanding this to different species as well. There's human, other human data sets now, and there's other mouse data sets, so we can strengthen it as we go along. Great. And there's a fantastic question from David Curtis around penetrance. So how often do we see um, possibly pathogenic variants in genes in controls who aren't affected by these conditions? And I guess as an extension for that, how reliable do you think your model systems are to prove non-pathogenicity as well as pathogenicity? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think the models themselves were showing highly penetrant phenotypes, but we were coming up 80, 90% penetrant. Uh, I think the more models that you look at, the better, but obviously this is very time consuming, labor intensive and expensive. Uh, at the moment, the variants that we see, we can only classify up to a certain stage and we can argue that they may not be fully penetrant and we will see variants coming through. However, we've not seen any frequency of, in these genes, um, observed in controlled cannibals. Great, and as a follow-up for that, again, there's quite a few questions in here that hopefully you can answer offline. Um, I'll ask one more before we close the session from Lydia Talbot, which is around kind of the um, strategy you use for variant interpretation and whether that leaned on the ACMG classifications. Yes, it did. Uh, we went through, obviously these are novel genes of interest. Uh, we looked at the ACMG classification and how the variants could be interpreted. And it was really bolstering that with the biological experimental data that we could generate as well to try and validate everything. Thank you very much indeed. We've just reached three o'clock, so we're going to sign off now so people can um, go on with their days. But thank you again to all three of the speakers today. It was a fantastic session. Um, a reminder that the seminars aren't running over the summer and will return at the end of September to hear some yet more exciting talks. But thank you once again to um, the three speakers today. That was really accessible and really interesting to hear those diverse um, experiments and data gathering exercises. So thank you very much.